Welcome to the uh, What If It's Not Depression podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Achina Stein. Today, we're going to be talking to Dr. Carmine Van Deven on a topic that I am intimately involved. As you all know, I'm an osteopathic physician, and I don't think I've really discussed with anyone on this podcast about the benefits of osteopathic medicine specifically. So today we are talking to Dr. Devin, who is an osteopathic physician, just like me, but he has a specific expertise in identifying and treating the underlying cause of complex illness from a place of health. He is a graduate of the Arizona College of Osteopathic Medicine, where he taught and conducted research as an OMM scholar. Dr. Van Devin completed a family medicine residency in Mount Vernon, Washington, and NMM fellowship in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Cranial and biodynamic osteopathy are a continual focus of study. He is dual board certified in family medicine and osteopathic manipulative treatment and neuromusculoskeletal medicine. Dr. Van Deven is also in private practice in Scottsdale, Arizona, where he provides a synergistic blend of traditional osteopathy and functional medicine. His holistic and heartfelt approach embraces the spiritual nature of each patient as a vital component of the healing process. Evaluation and treatment are applied in cooperation with natural law to resolve disease and to assist in the embodiment of the true self. Welcome Dr. Van Deven. Thank you, Dr. Stein. I'm so happy to be here. Oh, it's really great to have you. I love having uh, like-minded people, especially with the same training uh, on my on my podcast. And I I really want to do a deep dive in actually, do, you know, uh, in us in osteopathic manipulative medicine. And you know, but first, I would love to hear from you about you know being a DO and being a family medicine doctor. What was it about osteopathic medicine that had you sort of do a deeper dive in specifically OMM? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, it really came from the philosophy. And I think that's probably true for many of us. I, I read that in your book and I love that. So we're looking at the person as a whole. And when I was in my 20s, I was working in a gym, honestly, I was working as a trainer and I was working with people and seeing their lives change by way of diet and exercise and the relationships that were able to be fostered. Mm -hmm. And I just love seeing people come through and their own development and really see their lives change both physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And I was also recognizing that, you know, there was a glass ceiling approach and I didn't want to continue my life in the gym. I knew there was something else. There was some higher calling. There was some other greater purpose. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of like asked the universe and I kind of had very curious um, points of view of, you know, looking at the dimensions of spirituality and in health and energetics. And ultimately osteopathy found me. Mm -hmm. As I was seeking some help for my own musculoskeletal pain, a knee pain I was having at that time, for example, um, one thing led to another. I found myself in an office, an osteopath's office in the northern suburb of Chicago, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Karen Gaida, who has since passed, God bless her. And I was there as a patient. And the style of, os of osteopathy that she provided to myself in that, that meeting place was so beautiful and it was so it was a coming home mm. I mean I I just felt so at ease I felt like I, I've never felt so whole in my life mm. and in that moment in that experience lying on the table as the treatment was settling and continued to work even as she she left the room and went to another patient I I knew I was home Mm. And I knew that that was what I was here to do was to provide that same medicine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as one thing led to another, I found myself in the Arizona school and it was perfect and everything has, has worked out beautifully since then. 
Awesome. Awesome. That's a great story. I love that. I love that. So, you know, it's interesting, you know, I being a DO myself, some people understand what that is in, in comparison to being an MD. And I, I do talk about it sometimes with my patients, but I don't think they even realize what I do differently in the background. Uh, when I, as a DO, uh, for example, just watching the way a person walks into the room, it, you're doing a whole assessment just from that, picking up on all sorts of things. Uh, and how they turn and how they uh, move their arms and their legs and how they carry their, their body, their posture, all of that makes a huge difference. And those are things that we do as DOs uh, very intuitively without even realizing that we're doing it because we've been trained that way and connecting the dots in that way. So, um, so I'm sure there are patients of mine that are listening to this and they're going to learn a lot more about what we do uh, that they don't even realize. And so I would love for you to just start with like, what, like, what is osteopathic medicine? You know, just start from the basics so that even people that know or heard of DOs, you know, to really get the whole history and the gist of it. And, and then, you know, we can dive into how does this even help the brain or, or emotions, uh, including depression. Absolutely. Uh, well, there's a rich history. So I'll, I'll bring up some of the highlights. Um, osteopathy was not created, but it was a, a philosophy and a practice that was founded by an MD in the 1900s by the name of Andrew Taylor Still. Mm -hmm. And he was a, a general physician as they were at that time in the Midwest. He was serving in Missouri. He was taking care of the Shawnee Indians, for example. And during his time there, there was an epidemic of spinal meningitis that, that claimed three of his own children. Mm. And so here he is, he's supposed to be a physician helping people heal and he couldn't even save his own children. So he was so distraught and disturbed by this that he was he was determined to find a better way, determined to find a way that would actually provide the health and healing that he knew was possible. So he dove into his biochemistry, his anatomy, his physiology. He, he studied nature. He studied nature's laws as he was a man of the land. Um, his father was a preacher, so he had a tremendous amount of spirituality that continued to permeate and pass through his life and his practice. And he started studying anatomy mm -hmm. and he, he went as far as actually digging up the Indian burial grounds in the middle of the night so he could get the bony architecture in his hands. And so his study began with the bone as it related to disease, because the bone provided not only the structure of the body to move, but also a handle with which we can understand and manipulate the, the function of the body to restore health. Hence the, the name osteopathy, osteo as in bone, pathy is disease. So his entrance point and beginning of study started with the bone. Mm -hmm. So from there, he just started to kind of be aware of what was happening with his patients. At that time, you know, people were dying from measles, mumps, rubella, tuberculosis, pneumonia, dysentery, and more. And right. he was able to save them. He became known, he became known for saving lives and mm -hmm. helping people heal through conditions that were supposed to be unhealable. Mm -hmm. And at first, people thought he was doing witchcraft. They thought <laughs> he was doing some evil work because how else could this happen? They, they just like even today, if there's something we don't understand, we, we, you know, we, there's a fear around that. Right. Eventually, however, his reputation by way of his clinical results spoke for itself. People started to flocking to him. Even the railroad had to put in an extra stop where he was in Kirksville, Missouri. Wow. So that the, the, the hordes of people coming to him for treatment would have an easy way to, to get there and back. And eventually with that, other physicians and people that he had healed by way of his practice showed interest in learning what he was doing. That led to momentum that ended up in the creation of the first school and then eventually into the practice of, of medicine 
for the osteopathic medicine itself, as, as you and I are, are DOs that are part of that lineage now. Awesome. Wow. I love, you know, it was, I had forgotten that three of his children died and, and he couldn't, I had forgotten that part of his, of his story. Wow. That's awesome. And, That's awesome. Yeah, and, and he, he was so far ahead of his time. Even today, we're still reading what he had written as a guide to what we're doing. And I mean, he was talking about, for example, the communication of the cerebral spinal fluid with the lymphatics. Mm -hmm. What we now know is the lymphatic system, right? Right. He, exactly he was, right. he was palpating that in his hands. He was aware of that motion and that, that connection and that physiology and so much more. So there's, he, he gifted us a, just a priceless gift to humanity of that understanding that we can put into practice today. Right. And we do with craniosacral therapy, right? Cranial, cranial osteopathy. Yes. Yeah. Cranial osteopathy. Cran Cranial osteopathy. Yeah. yeah. So I, you know, so I would love for you to talk more about those systems and, and connect to how does this improve mood or depression? Yeah. Yeah. So you wouldn't think that it would, at least, you know, the, our average person and, and most physicians, you know, look at them as almost two independent um, expressions, two independent structures, mm -hmm. functions. But the truth is our physiology needs a way of operating. It mm -hmm. needs a container within which to, to process and go through all the biochemistry. It needs a way for neurotransmitters and hormones to move through the body to get to their, their end point, to get to their, the receptors and their organs, blood supply, you know, so and as we know with more these days about the mind body connection, about how stress releases certain neurotransmitters and changes the function of the HPA axis, mm -hmm. um, adrenal function, cortisol release, you know, there's an almost immediate response of our physiology to perceive stress. But even that has a, a structural component. Mm -hmm. So if, for example, the, the pituitary, Mm -hmm. The pituitary sits in the cella tersica and it's almost like a saddle. Mm -hmm. And so there's a motion necessary to actually to create a pumping mechanism. So it kind of moves the fluid around this, this Venus Island around the pituitary to move the hormones and the neurotransmitters of the brain. And in this case, those from the anterior posterior pituitary those hormones to be circulated to other parts of the body, to be, to be expressed as well as to receive information back from the rest of the body. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's an innate rhythm, uh, a structural rhythm that is, that is taking place in and of the brain as it mm -hmm. coils and uncoils in the cranium, mm -hmm. just as when we breathe, the lungs expand and contract with each inhalation. Mm -hmm. and our diaphragm descends there's this there's a symphony of motion taking place in the body that that allows the physiology to work in a healthy manner so if we have some kind of trauma if we have a head trauma a motor vehicle accident mm -hmm. even a, a fall onto our bottom from ice or loose gravel those traumas impact the physical structure right. and if we if we displace the physical structure or the vectors from that impact can, can suspend the body in these dysfunctional patterns and literally distort that functional physiology. Mm -hmm. You know, you can think of it as like stepping on the hose and the hose is trying to provide, you know, lymphatics, glymphatics, arterial supply with oxygen and nutrition and so much more. And there's just a cascade of effects that can take place, you know? Right. Right. Absolutely. The greatest, the greatest as it relates to, um, you know, depression and moods um, is related to the autonomic nervous system mm -hmm. and the central nervous system. Right. So if there's a disruption there, we can't go to rest. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole cascade of, of things that happen from there. I mean, it, it's, it's a huge topic. We could, we could spend, we could spend a weeks talking about the, the, the relationship of structure and function, right? But the reality, and this is this is something to keep in mind. The reality is they're not separate. 
the, the function of an organ, the function of a system is, is expressed by way of the structure mm -hmm. and the structure would affect the function in the same manner. So with osteopathy and, and this hands-on work and talking with the patient as a whole individual, we're able to work on these various dimensions and manifestations of life as we know it without, without limiting ourselves to the possibilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, you know, that was a great, great um, description of what it might be going on uh, around the brain and in the brain. And we talked about the history and philosophy of osteopathy, but we didn't actually talk about what it is manually from a manual physical sense. Like, what is it that you actually do? Because it's not something that I necessarily do with my patients. I, I do all functional medicine pretty much. There was a time where I did do, um, you know, some, some uh, osteopathic manipulation, but it wasn't like the thing that I did all the time, but it sounds like you do it a lot more. If you can explain what it is that you actually do in, in terms of an assessment and, and sure. how you treat, give an example of how you treat people, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Sure. And, you know, we all have, um, a similar foundation of training by way of our, our medical training. And then from there, kind of where we where we move with our particular practice is all always going to be unique to the physician. So um, I'm, I'll be happy to share, you know, through the lens of my experience and where where I practice as a almost a personal expression of my own evolution. Right. Mm. So so being a physician, we're always taking a thorough history and physical mm -hmm. exam. And I also practice integrative and functional medicine. So, you know, I'm always asking about different kinds of traumas, different types of toxic exposures, infections, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I can get a sense of the whole picture. Mm -hmm. um, while we're doing this, I'm also, you know, listening. I'm listening with my heart. I'm listening with my mind. I'm listening to the presence in the room. I'm listening to the individual in a way to hear what's what's being spoken between the words. Mm -hmm. What are the feelings between what they're sharing to get a better sense of who they are as a spiritual being, a spiritual individual in this in their own personal evolution. And then we we move to, a, a, you know, what would be a normal structural exam, you know, heart, lungs, Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes check range of motion of, you know, the neck and the arms by by way of just a gentle moving. So mm -hmm. I would I would maybe move the body gently, passively. You know, how well does the neck move and the back move and maybe move their shoulders a little bit just to get a sense of the structural fluidity mm -hmm. that's present. And as I'm doing that, I'm also paying attention to the ease that is hopefully permeating through their, their being. So a sense of um, motion that is not limited to the structural motion. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, some individuals might be in a shock. Mm -hmm. um, shock is when we have an overwhelming event and that could be from various kinds, an emotional, mental, even spiritual, chemical, infectious, and, and shock, locks the body down like it, it's bracing in mm -hmm. this um, reactive process it's just it's just holding on tight so sometimes when we put our hands on we can feel this bracing through the tissues through the field of the individual that's holding them in tight they're trying to stay safe and brace and and so we want to encourage that that full expression of life and life force Mm -hmm. So that that's something that we would have the goal of achieving at the end of treatment, but that's something that we can perceive even in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And so after we, we're getting a, a global sense of the individual, we're getting a sense of some motion, I'll sometimes have them take a deep breath and kind of observe how their body is able to move with that, that respiration. And then I'll typically you know, as you mentioned before, you know, I've already kind of watched them walk. If I need to have that again, we will. And then they proceed onto the, the table. Mm -hmm. um, from there, it's it can take a lot of different directions depending on the person and where they are with their own health. Are, mm -hmm. they, are they able to go to rest? Mm -hmm. That's a very important, you know, question and place to explore. 
because if they're not able to go to rest, it's going to be very, um, it's going to be more challenging to help their body come to a place of self-correction, mm -hmm. have the treatment come through into their entirety because they're not operating as a whole. Mm -hmm. So we, we can, we can work with the structure. We can kind of find these physical strain patterns. We can find areas where the body's not moving well and help provide ease mm -hmm. through the musculature, ease through the joints, ease by way of motion of the lungs as, as we help them come into a greater sense of ease. Mm -hmm. And as we're doing this, we're also paying attention to these other innate mechanisms that that preceded even the structure. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a midline function, for example, um, that provides orientation for the whole. Mm -hmm. There's that expression, that breathing function that is both of the lungs and of what we call primary respiration. So this, this other, other greater breathing of them as their wholeness. Mm -hmm. And I'm paying attention to where we need to work, where how I can relate to them in that process. Um, ultimately, trying to assist them to a place where they can be neutral, where their body has a sense of, of wholeness and mm -hmm. homogeneity mm -hmm. so that they're able to shift. And assisting in that process while always, always listening I'm always listening and, and perceiving what we call the health, the patient's health. It's, it's that divine force. It's the, the perfect of them. It's mm -hmm. their, their, their ability to be their, their full selves and in, in the brightest, most beautiful sense. Mm -hmm. And so that those indwelling forces um, are always there helping the patient, always recreating the patient and also directing this healing process. Right. So we're, we're, we're enacting, it's, it's this beautiful, almost, a, it's this dance almost where I'm led by the intelligence of the patient of how and where to be present with them and their health and to support their, their full becoming of that, right. whether it's helping a diaphragm release or, removing a restriction within a bone or, or helping their nervous system come to a place of rest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, I love the way you describe that. Uh, it's like poetry, <laughs> really, the way you speak and describe it, it as a dance. I totally agree with you in terms of the philosophy of approaching the patient. That's so well said. Yeah. So, you know, for some people, they probably won't know that, um, that what you're looking at is it, it is the whole body and the goal is to reach optimal health no matter what it takes basically whatever it takes to get the, that person to optimal health and to empower them to want that for themselves and to see it for themselves as well and to work with mm -hmm. you in that so that's where the dance is because it's a it's a back and forth kind of exchange even without words on some level right so yeah so it's absolutely yeah. So when I, and I love the way you describe that it's releasing and putting that person in a place of rest because it takes a lot of energy to not be at that place. And most people, when they, when they are going on with their lives, don't even realize that they have, uh, you know, constrictions of sorts, or they're out of, out of alignment or out of things are out of place. They might sense it on some level, but then it's ignored. I, you know, I, when I, when I have palpated, let's say, you know, my kids or my husband, you know, you could say like, oh, this is really tight here. It's like, yeah, but they ignore it, you know, <laughs> like, so doing something about it, you know, is going to be really important, right. but they don't realize how much, like with, for lack of a better word, damage or 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 energy or burden how much of a burden it actually becomes to the body over time and then your body's constantly trying to get back to this place of rest and and it's yes. able to so you're basically assisting the body to find its place of rest you know on right you're just releasing things yes yeah yes and, and it's by way of cause it's, mm -hmm. you know, we've been, we've been given a great gift 
from AT still and, and you know those that have continued the work to to teach us now to help identify cause. Mm -hmm. and, and cause can can live in in so many dimensions and multiple dimensions at the same time, you know, by way of emotional stress and trauma, um, physical stress and trauma, our physiology being stressed, et cetera. Right. But the beauty of osteopathy is that we are given the ability to, to listen, to identify and help resolve at the level of cause. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes if it's a structural layer, for example, the dominal diaphragm it is, is so important. And, you know, at the very least, not only does it help us take full breaths, which we need to oxygen for ATP production and, and all the other necessary components that oxygen is used for, but the vagus nerve also passes through the esophageal hiatus. Mm -hmm. And so the motion of the diaphragm, if it's normal and healthy, stimulates the vagus nerve. Mm -hmm. And people are using external and internal vagal nerve stimulators and doing all these things to calm the nervous system where we have the natural mechanisms in place as this being just one example that are there to regulate ourselves internally and, you know, support these natural rhythms and these healing forces that are, that we have in every moment. Right. And in, in, in other cases, it might be, um, you know, something that's preventing the glymphatic system from draining all of the, the toxins and metabolic byproducts from the brain. Mm -hmm. And we can feel these structural restrictions in the cranial base and in other places where the fluid is trying to move and flow. So we can be present in a way to help open up those channels so that our natural physiology has an opportunity to come back to health. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then the cascade of events that happens after that. So it's, it's profound. Right. Yeah. Drainage is really important. And there's a lot of research now on the glymphatic system. And we, we didn't know that that was present. I mean, I think AT still probably knew or intuited that in, in terms of his, but we, you know, didn't know what to call it, didn't really have a necessarily, a, you know, research on it, but he could feel it in, in his hands. And so now we have research to actually support uh, you know, that yes, this glymphatic system actually does exist. Can you talk more about this glymphatic system in terms of how it's connected to the immune system? Um, certainly. So the glymphatic system is an extension of the immune system and its ability to operate within the brain itself. Mm -hmm. And what we need to remember is that the glymphatic system, like other fluid motion and expressions of health, still has... Uh, physical restraints. It has a container within which it operates. Mm -hmm. So there are dural sinuses, places where that fluid is moving around and through the brain in different channels that, that need to be free. So the glymphatics, the fluids of the CSF as it, as it expresses these proteins and these metabolic byproducts, it needs a freedom of motion so that they can be flushed out of the brain and, and removed to leave the brain and all of the, the cells, the astrocytes and the, the different nuclei and all these important areas for function to leave the cells and the cellular function, the neurons and so on to be healthy. They, they want their environment to be healthy. We want every cell to be healthy. And this is true throughout the body, but especially in the brain as it relates to this. Mm -hmm. So by way of assisting in that natural rhythm that takes place of the brain itself and of the cranium, the, the bony encasing of the brain, as well as different channels that, that it's, it's passing through the venous system coming out of the brain, we're able to provide that freedom of motion. Mm -hmm. and thereby improve the function and change that entire biochemical landscape within which the brain is operating so it has a chance to be its healthiest, most vital function that it can. Improving mood, improving even things of, you know, memory and dementia. Um, and I mean, the list goes on and on. Right, right. I mean, it's essentially taking out the trash, <laughs> right? It's like the sanitation department finally showed up to take out the trash from the brain. <laughs> you know, it's so releasing right. those, right. Um, releasing those. And the, and the inflammation. 
And the inflammation, absolutely. So it's inflammation yeah. that's creating all sorts of symptoms, not just depression and anxiety. You know, we forget about all of the physical symptoms that come along with depression and anxiety, um, you know, or neurological symptoms like the cognitive problems, memory, memory issues, concentration problems, energy problems, uh, mm -hmm. sleep and appetite issues or it's all connected. It's all connected. Mm -hmm. And it's not, so sometimes people see those symptoms, those physical symptoms as being a reaction to the depression. But I see that as concomitant symptoms or early symptoms generally that then ultimately affects a very, very, um, sensitive organ, which is our brain. Mm -hmm. Very, very sensitive. So I just see inflammation really affecting the brain and not necessarily the depression causing all the physical symptoms, right? It's all connected. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. And the, and the autonomics as an intimate part of that, that extends, you know, beyond the brain itself from through the, the, the thoracic cervical and thoracic sympathetic nerves to mm -hmm. what's happening, but the parasympathetic nerves of the sacrum. Mm -hmm. So it, if there was, you know, one of the most important ways that osteopathy can help with depression and so many other conditions is to help normalize the function of the autonomics. Mm -hmm. So like I said, they are able to come to rest so that they can sleep better. Right. And if they can sleep better, then their lymphatic system has a better opportunity to be functional. You know, their mood gets a reset, their energy can go up. And then as we also help restore fluid motion through the musculoskeletal system, then they can start to move. They can start to exercise more easily. They're not, they're not sitting or laying in pain and limiting themselves. They're no longer in that downward spiral, but rather an upward spiral. Right. So in the implications with endorphins and mood improvement and inflammation reduction and immune function improvement, I mean, it's just a, it's an upward cascade that we have the opportunity to provide. Right, right. I mean, I think it's very important to to see how things cascade or spiral down, you know, and not just look at endpoint symptoms when it comes to making a diagnosis. You know, we're trained to put all this information that's happened to a patient on a timeline to even see the cascade over time. You can actually see it happening over time. And and it's not like a sudden, suddenly you're depressed. No, all of these events happened that resulted in, in this depression. And I, I was telling you um, about uh, one of my friends who had a, a very, very severe reaction to a situation that ultimately led her to an inpatient unit, psychiatric unit hospitalization, because, and this is a woman who had had no psychiatric problems, but because she was in so much pain and couldn't sit um, and had mm -hmm. sought so many doctors that uh, at, at some point they just felt that she was med seeking for pain medications and not really in pain uh, that, uh, and they weren't really giving her the time uh, of day to try to figure it out with her. Ultimately, she had a pelvic subluxation and I was able to diagnose that over the phone <laughs> with her. Well and done. Yes. And you needed, I said, you need to see somebody who does OMM and here's, uh, here's some numbers, call them, let me know how you're doing with them. And uh, sure enough, she did see somebody and they treated the pelvic subluxation and within two sessions, her pain was gone. And she needed obviously some more sessions just to keep her, you know, keep her there but it gave her so much relief, but they basically had to admit her because she was in so much pain that she said, I'm going to kill myself if I don't get relief, um, or I'd rather die than deal with this anymore. So, uh, right. yeah. And so when, after she was discharged, she called me and, uh, I, I helped her to find the right provider for her, uh, just from a phone, you know, phone conversation. So, uh, I'm really glad that she got the help. And there's a lot of people out there who are seen by our MD counterparts. God bless them. I mean, they have their training and, and they, but it's limited right. and they don't have right. the same training that we do and they don't really right. know what they don't know. And so how are they going to know to refer 
And so I think it's so right. important that we all work together, our naturopath, um, you know, colleagues and our chiropractor colleagues, they all have, we all have our gifts and we all have something to contribute. And if we collaborate um, and, uh, with each other, I think it is going to be in the best interest of the patient in the long run. Yeah, I wish there, I wish everyone could have a team like that. Mm -hmm. You know, so we, we do the best we can and we, we teach and we share what we're doing so others can learn and continue to provide this so more people can have more relief. Right, right. Yes, I, I approach everything as a team approach. I have a health coach and an FDNP working with me and it's been, it's been really, really successful in getting very sick people in a better place. So, yeah, so I, um, I want to know how people can find a DO that provides OMM because there's lots of DOs out there. And as, you know, as there's more and more schools, as you were saying, we were talking about this earlier and it was really sad to hear that um, the, the education um, of, uh, of actually learning OMM has diminished um, in, in many schools. And that's really sad to hear, but there are a lot of DOs who are keeping it alive. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd love to hear from you how people, what's the best way to find someone in their state or nearby, um, that does OMM spe specifically. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Great question. Um, there's two websites. I always refer individuals to, to, to get a sense because um, these websites list people with uh, particular training. So you know that they've gone well above and beyond um, what the basics include so that they are they have more tools or they have more skill set to provide uh, for patients and for various needs. Um, one of them is traditional osteopathy, edu.com, mm -hmm. traditional osteopathy, edu.com. Mm -hmm. And that lists both uh, physician osteopaths as well as non-physician osteopaths. And then the other is the cranialacademy.org, cranialacademy.org. And that, that also lists uh, physician and non-physician osteopaths with, and both of those groups have training in cranial osteopathy. Um, the first one is um, specific to what's called biodynamic osteopathy, mm -hmm. which is a very subtle form of, of application and, and um, fairly, um, it's beautiful. And it, that's the kind of osteopathy that I received when I had my first treatment when I knew I was home. Wow. So. Yeah, awesome, awesome. And you know, I think it's important to mention too that there are DOs in Europe um, that aren't physicians, um, but they do osteopathy. And I think that's what you're also referring to as non-physician osteopathy osteopaths right 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 yeah so in the united states this is the only country in the world where the do's are tra trained as physicians mm -hmm. um, in other countries you know our neighbors up north in canada for example um, and france and spain and new zealand australia and the, and the list goes on and on um, they they specialize in osteopathy so they have four years of training and they their skills are excellent because that's where their focus is. Um, whereas here in the States, you know, the focus is more on the medicine and it kind of leaves the individual and the student to pursue more training for the osteopathy, the hands-on application of those same principles. Right, right. Yes. So it is alive. Yay. <laughs> it's still alive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's alive. And there are some wonderful people out there that that are wanting to make sure that it stays alive, including myself. So we're we're doing what we can to, to pass the torch and continue this work for the great service that it provides humanity. Great, great. Well, wonderful. Can you just let people know uh, where people can find you? Um, sure. So I'm in Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, my website is drvandevin.com. That's just D-R-V-A-N-D-E-V-E-N.com. Great. Thank you so much. I have loved having this conversation with you and uh, you've really updated me as well as the state of osteopathic medicine and, or OMM specifically. So 
I really appreciate your time and uh, and getting to know you better too. Thank, thank you. It's, it's been a pleasure and um, look forward to continue working and seeing how this can flourish. So thank okay. you, Dr. Stein. Oh, you're very welcome. Take care. Mm -hmm.